special education support technician with the Chiefs of Ontario. I would like to welcome you to, to the decolonizing education workshop series that we are, we, we're, uh, we're currently in module one, uh, mobilizing truth and reconciliation, the TRC calls to education. Um, first, I would like to begin by acknowledging that we are uh, celebrating the International Women's Day today, and it's uh, such a such a great day to to start. Um, I would also acknowledge the Anishinaabe territory that I'm currently um, working from, the city of Thunder Bay, and it was built on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, and it includes the Ojibwe uh, Nation of Fort William First Nation, a signatory to the Robinson uh, Superior Treaty of 1850. I also want to acknowledge that there are other uh, 46 other agreements that cover the territory now called Ontario. We are thankful to be to be able to work and live in these territories. We are thankful to the First Nation Métis Inuit people who have cared for these territories since time and immemorial and who, who continue to contribute to the strength of Ontario and to all the communities across the province. I also wanna acknowledge that there are nations who have not signed any treaties and are acknowledged as unceded First Nation territories. The Chiefs of Ontario is honored to work and collaborate with our brothers and sisters, clients, stakeholders, and communities throughout the various territories. The, the Chiefs of Ontario would also like to acknowledge his, that its head office is located in Toronto and on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the New Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat people, and now home to many diverse nations, Inuit, Métis people. We are home to, uh, we also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty Number 13 signed with the Mississaugas of the New Credit and the Williams Treaty signed by multiple Mississauga and Chippewa bands. I also want to identify that the traditional First Nation territories is one way to recognize contemporary, contemporary and historical First Nation presence and land rights. It's a small step. Uh, towards dismantling the continued impacts of colonialism and undoing uh, First People removal from our everyday lives. Uh, before I get to the introduction of our guest speaker, I'd like to um, go through our uh, administrative process for our session today. So our module will run for approximately two hours. Uh, the presentation will be completed first with the Q&A after afterwards. If you have any questions or comments, use the chat within the Zoom. Often, I, for one, when I go through a presentation, I have many questions in the real time. So I use the chat as a, a memory key. So please uh, feel free to do, uh, use that. And when you go to the bottom of your screen, you hit on that chat and it'll, it'll get you to that area. The microphones, uh, your microphone should be muted in the interest of utilizing our time. There will also be an evaluation at the end of our session, so please submit your comments, suggestions, as they are valuable moving forward. Um, I also want to identify the content um, may cause negative or personal uh, experience, and if, if this happens, reach out to family or trusted confidant, a local elder. So what I've done is I posted the information for the Hope for Wellness line. And that will also be included in your chat. So our, our, our speaker and the introduction for her speaker, and I apologize for going through the administrative um, process, but it's uh, very important to acknowledge the the very critical areas of our, our work that we're doing today. So our speaker today for the series is Dr. Cynthia Wesley Esquimo, who originates from the Chippewas of the Georgina Island First Nation. She is the chair of the Truth and Reconciliation 
at Lakehead University for the past seven years. And she's also the chair of the governing circle for the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation at the University of Manitoba. So everyone, please welcome Dr. Cynthia Wesley Esquimo. The floor is yours. <laughs> Good morning, and thank you so much for your patience. I was in a room. I was in a room for 20 minutes. I'm like, where is everybody? <laughs> so I appreciate you guys having the patience to wait it out. And I also want to say happy happy uh, uh, National Women's Day. It, it is an important day to begin this conversation because this conversation is fundamentally about women and children and, and the work that we all do together. But we always got to include the men. I'm, all big, I'm always big about, about that. So yes, yeah, so my name is Cynthia. It's, it's actually Wesley Eskimo. So just so I, it's not so we know how it's actually uh, said. So I'm from the Chippewas of Georgina Island. I have uh, I'm a grandmother. I have five daughters and I have five granddaughters. <laughs> I also have two female cats and a female dog. So my husband is the only guy in the house. So I don't know if he enjoys that or not. But lots of lots of women today. So lots of women in my family as well. And yes, I'm the chair for the uh, the National Center. So I do a lot of work on reconciliation. And I uh, so we're going to start this conversation with the whole question around the truth and reconciliation calls to action. For some of you, you may be very familiar with them. Some of you maybe not so much you know you're aware of them you've heard of them you've kind of looked at them so I'm just going to sort of categorize them a little bit for you so you have a, a sense of what we're going to do and I'm going to try to stick very closely to the time frames that we've set out so that we have a, a lot of time to ask question uh, ask questions and actually also talk to each other a little bit about some of the things that are important to us as as as, indiv as individuals so there's lots about it so this one, um, as Patricia has said, is mobilizing the TRC calls to action. So we want to open up here with this, the 10 principles that are supposed to guide this conversation into the future. Oh, oh okay. Can you just uh, let me, if I can share it, I'll do it myself. Okay. Um, yeah, just so I, so I can do it when I'm, when I get there. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> let me see if I can share my own screen and that way I, I know what I'm doing and then we'll, okay. Let me share the screen. Um, we'll put it up and we'll, we'll start it there. Okay, so that's what we're doing. We're going to be sharing those 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 conversations. So let me just go to the uh, first slide then, so we can actually just start with it. So those are the the actual mobilized mobilizing one is going to be about about these the ninety four calls to action, the ten principles that actually lead us through that conversation, and also the the uh, the thirteen principles that have been put forward by university professors because they also have a very integral relationship to the work that we're going to be talking about here as we look at education and indigenizing education sort of on the ground level. Webinar two is going to be wise practices in education and deconstructing that special in special education. That's the conversation that we've had that we don't really want to have. Uh, our kids, you know, sort of classify or ca characterize a special education. They're extraordinary children. They may have extraordinary challenges ahead of them, but we want to be sure that we're actually coming at it from that perspective. And I think that's really important. And then webinar three, indigenizing uh, indigenizing education. We want to then go back to the whole question of of elders and the land and talking about land based learning because that's a big deal right across the country. People are trying to figure out how do we do this, and when we do this, what comes after. And then how do we create flex learning and lifting community morale, excellence and pride? Uh, that's one of the things um, I just had that conversation at the Chiefs of Ontario um, national event or health event. And that was the thing that people are concerned about. There's a lot of addictions in our communities. There's a lot going on that we we really want to be able to address. And so doing this by, through the process of education, I think is going to be the way that it's going to work best. And then the final one, and, and we'll also, by the way, it, throughout here to have a couple of guest speakers where I can fit them in because I think that that's also really important. Um, on the webinar four, the last one we do, is going to be facilitating a circle of learning that includes truth and, and restoration of educational jurisdiction and authority. And I know that that's something that we're all very keen on, that, that we bring that whole process back to, back to the communities, that they have that authority to, to make the kinds of choices they want and how their children are going to learn and those, those rights and reconciliation. And, and in those places, we want you to talk about defining the purpose of education for your children. What do you want them to learn and why do you want them to learn it? And how do we, how do we promote that? The value of indigenizing education at the ground level, certainly for the Chiefs of Ontario communities, but really just generally across the board, because that has been a real challenge, I think, for everybody. So we'll speak to the need to clarify the roles responsibility is as we move forward for the reclamation of Indigenous languages, which I think we're doing a great job of, by the way, cultures, 
educational governance systems. And I've said this before, and I'll say it again, you know, we've all stated that every child matters. And now it's really time to ask ourselves and, 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 and work together on this, what matters to every child? And, and that's going to help us move forward, I think, in, in a really important way. So this first web webinar is going to be in a presentation format. I'm not, I don't have any guest speakers. I'm not going to be uh, you know, share, sharing the space so much as I'm going to be uh, giving you different kinds of demonstrations about and, and different kinds of uh, statistical data, not heavy duty. So don't worry about that. But, I, but what I really want is for participants to start thinking about these conversations and thinking about what they'd like to see happen when it comes to identifying the needs of extraordinary children. What do they absolutely have to have? Uh, and then considering the content of the school curriculum based on those seven calls to action that we're gonna delve deeper into. And then also, you know, as we cover the 94 calls to action and the 10 principles which guide that conversation on truth and reconciliation, um, we'll look a little bit at the 13 principles. I'm just gonna kind of go through them fairly quickly so that you have a sense of what's happening at different levels because our kids start with education in the home, but then they're going to be moving through primary school, they're going to be moving into high school, and then we hope they're going to move into college or trade school, and then on to potentially university if that's what they choose. Not everybody is academically oriented, so obviously everybody's not going to necessarily go in that direction. So we'll open with that call. Uh, the commissioners, you know, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, was important. It was part of the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement in 2007. That was the largest class action in Canadian history. So we have done some amazing work and pushed through some amazing, amazing conversations. Commissioners, of course, Marie Sinclair, Wilton Littlechild, and Marie Wilson had six-year mandate to listen to and record the stories of residential school survivors, and they heard almost 7,000 statements. They inducted almost 100 uh, honorary witnesses to work on reconciliation. So there's a lot of people out there that are actually actively engaged in this particular conversation. The idea was to witness, support, promote, and facilitate truth and reconciliation events at both the national and regional levels. And I, and I think, uh, actually, I would add local and community levels as well. We have work to do on our own levels, and I think that that's, start, that's been starting and been going on for a long time, and it's getting stronger, and that's where we want to focus our attention. So the whole question of witnesses, um, the witnesses are just people that are called to be the keepers of history. And, and to remember these things. And it, at one time in our communities, that was a really important part of who we were, that oral tradition, that oral history, that ability to listen to and watch and observe and, and iterate into the future, the kinds of different kinds of activities and the things that were going on that were really important. So it, you know, that's, I think, really important in the context of the work that, that, we, that we actually do. So I'm going to be throwing a fair bit of information at you today. I mean, that's kind of the way it is because there's a lot going on, uh, right, locally for us, regionally, and of course, nationally, and actually even internationally, we've been called upon to actually talk about the work that we do and how that actually works in other places. So it's a, there's a lot going on, and I think we need to be aware that, that we bring a lot to the conversation. The first one, of course, is, uh, is child welfare. Child welfare has five calls to action. And, and, and ostensibly, it's to ensure social workers and other people are properly educated and trained on Indigenous history and cultural practices. It's not about cultural competency, because I, I think if, as long as we have some cultural awareness, uh, some cultural intelligence and understanding, and also cultural humility, I think we can get to where we can go. And we'll some, talk about some of those terms as we move forward. But more important in this particular area is the restoration of jurisdiction and authority over our children. We have too many kids in care. Uh, you know, I said at the conference, you know, my daughter talked about how, you know, these signs that say how many children will, will leave the community until you become a foster parent, you know, and then when she was 21, she's now 38, and saying, you know, that should say how many, how many children will leave the community before we decide to become parents. We want to focus in on helping parents. We want to focus in on helping them do what they need to do and get the, the help that they need and the prevention care that they need to be able to do this. We want to focus in on how the monies are allocated to the communities, whether they go to the to the uh, agencies or whether they go directly to the families and the community so that they can do the preventative work. We want to address the standards that are put in place and, and our communities are held to, which are not necessarily ever appropriate for the work that we're trying to do at the ground level. And finally, we really have to talk about the relationship between the provinces and the territories and the work that we're trying to do in community. So there's a lot going on there. Really what we're talking about is total reform, 
of child welfare and prevention, not apprehension. So lots of work going on there. And I know we have a lot of Indigenous agencies, but many of them are under the auspices of the overarching child welfare system. And we want to move them out of that and more closer to the ground so that we can actually direct how they work. That's the jurisdiction and authority uh, component. So the, the next one, of course, is the whole question of education. There are four calls to action on education, uh, and they focus, you know, that's our focus uh, as we go through these webinars. And it's about the development of a joint strategy to eliminate those education and employment gaps that are existing between Canadians and Indigenous peoples and to cooperatively develop culturally appropriate curriculum. We know in Ontario that as soon as Doug Ford got in, he canceled the curriculum development piece. So we have, it has still continued on, just not as much as it might have gone on if uh, he hadn't done that. But I think when it comes down to the question of how this is going to work, that this is really about us and our work. All the way back to 1972, you can see on the timeline there, the Indian control of education mean that we were going to take this back and we were going to do everything we possibly could with it. And now we have these tools that Royal Commission, the United Nations Declaration, you know, that whole question of reconstituting the, our First Nations control in 2010, and all the way through down to, to the uh, final report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. We have the tools that are in place, and the government ostensibly has recognized that that is what we're looking at. We're not looking at them to do it for us. We're not looking at what they have to say about it. You know, we're looking at what our people actually want and need, especially when it comes to the extraordinary children we have in our communities who actually are not getting the kinds of resources that they need to be able to move forward. The next one is uh, languages, and there are five calls to action on languages, and they have actually started to work on the enactment of an Aboriginal Languages Act. There has been a language commissioner put in place, and there is funding that has gone across the country to actually deal with languages, and we can see this is just a slide from one of um, you know many slides uh, on this particular conversation that there are in fact children learning. So now this was done in 2020, there's many, there's many Indigenous children as elders who can speak an Indigenous language. And it is something that people are very interested in. And at the same time, I know from the North, uh, that there are people that are that the kids are not learning the language and, and you know, they don't want to learn the language. So there's a lot of work here to do to actually lift the reasons why, you know, language is a really important consideration for everyone. So that's something that we're working on. There's seven calls to action on health. And, and again, it's about closing those gaps and recognizing the value of Indigenous healing practices. And, and I know that, uh, that Joe Pitawanaquit has a lot to say about this, and I have a lot to say about it as well, because health is a critical element of the future of our nations. We don't restore the health practices that are of, of our own. We're going to be in trouble because people are dying far too young and there's far too much diabetes and other systemic disorders in our communities. So this is just sort of a there's that Western model that's, you know, very hierarchical and very judgmental and by the book. And we've all run into that at, at different points, including my own daughter, who was told when she had her baby in 2020, when she asked uh, for a man to put a mask on in, in, in her in her room with her newborn. Um, uh, the nurse told her, if you complain, I'm calling CAS on you. So, <laughs> which was really shocking to my daughter, but still happens 2020. And then on the other side, you know, as a patient where we're trying to bring in that other kind of um, understanding and cultural humility and, and intelligence where it is restorative, uh, there's wise practices that are brought forward. Our medicine people are allowed to be a part of this conversation, you know, that it's narrative based and community is a part of the conversation. Very important part of of those calls to action, those seven calls to action. The most important ones, and again, these are the backdrop to all of the work that we want to do to actually restore and change education to suit our own purposes, is justice. And there are 18 calls for to, to justice. Uh, this is a really serious consideration. Uh, this is competency training for lawyers and police judges and law students, all supposedly working collaboratively with us to try to resolve this. This is very recent, this is 2020. Um, we wanna eliminate that over-representation of indigenous peoples in custody. And I did show you this slide at the at the, at the the health thing, the indigenous adults in custody as opposed to the uh, indigenous adults in the, in the general population and, this, and the youth. It is the youth, we are not reaching our youth. And this is the particular area which is most important for us. And this is another slide that sort of gives you an, an understanding in, tw in 2020 again, from 2000 to 2020, all of the incarceration rates have risen. They've just continuously gone up. They're not going down. 
So this is an important component of how do we actually build nationhood in a way that actually brings our young people along with us and gives them the tools that we want them to have to be able to carry all of this forward. So this is one of the, these two, you know, uh, you know the whole question of child welfare and the, and the question of, of uh, justice are incredibly important uh, parts of the conversation that we're going to have over the next four, three webinars. Uh, this is about general reconciliation. So I want to talk a little bit about it. There's 23 calls to action on general, on general reconciliation, and that includes the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, the revision or, or time and attention paid to the 1763 Royal Proclamation. I want to bring that forward and actually update it. The whole question of settler agreements and what's going on there, equity in the legal system, which I just spoke to, the National Council for Truth and Reconciliation, and of course, the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation, and then professional development and training for churches and government and, and public education generally. So this, this chart was put together by David Newhouse. I think it's an important one because it sort of, you know, categorizes that long assault, you know, that whole question of everything that happened through the residential schools, uh, you know, the implementation of, implementation of the Indian Act, and all the rest of it, all the way through to, you know, Indian control of Indian education when, you know, we, you know, as 1969 happened with the white paper, you know, we started to, you know, fight back in like right across the, the board, very important, but the law, he calls it the long assault. And then all of that, it constitutes that legacy of loss of dispossession and, and the loss of jurisdiction and authority in, in certain areas. So now the conversation, the Canada agenda is reconciliation. And as you and I know, that is something that is not necessarily happening. And, and all of those pieces I just showed you are the reasons why. How can we talk about reconciliation when we haven't actually changed the most important things to accommodate what we actually need. So the Indigenous agenda is coming up from the ground, and I think um, we have our own reconciliation process as far as I'm concerned. But the whole question is closing the gap, that equity building and actually restoration of that jurisdiction authority, that uh, harmony and between settler relations, which I'll show you as we go forward, is not necessarily happening, and restoration of the nation-to-nation -nation relationship. Um, that nation-to-nation -nation relationship I also heard is, is not necessarily a goal anymore. It's more about establishment of our own nations, our own nation, so that we can actually move things forward a lot more quickly than they have gone. And then, of course, those critical conversations about Canada and what Canada is or is not doing um, is an important consideration here as well and this is an indication for those of you that are like where are we now um, this is 2021 so this is fairly new it's as new as they can be uh, things move fairly slowly but it shows you in little nutshells you know how how have we done and it's you know you can see you know the percentage you have a good understanding of indigenous people's experience past and present mostly us indigenous peoples have a good sense of that and know more about it and are, and are actually picking up that history i think in a good way our kids have always wanted that but there you know a little over half of the canadian population has that understanding you know the percentage you say residential schools harmed indigenous peoples we know that they harmed indigenous peoples and continue to have legacy effect and, and resonance into the present a few more people, 61% know and think, yes, it did some damages. And, you know, who agrees that governments harmed Indigenous peoples? You know, we understand from our work and our experiences, our lived experiences, that that has happened. Not Canadian population, not so sure. And then those who have agreed the past actions continue to affect us. We understand and see that we have too many kids in care. We have too many people in incarceration. We have too many uh, youth dropping out of school and struggling through their lives. So we understand that. And so all of those pieces are, are important parts of the conversation. So this will be on online for you to actually come back and look at it a little bit more in depth. So the other one, there's only one call to action on the question of youth. And I think you know, we, we, we know that that's probably important, but there's only one call. Um, and this is the one that Prime Minister Trudeau took on as his own call. So I guess if I was challenging anybody on what's happening to youth and the resources that are, are going to them, it would be uh, Prime Minister Trudeau would be getting my letter first and has gotten my letter first. But we need to do more to, to push him to do more for our kids because the addictions rates are way out of out of control and we need to do something more about that. And everybody is very clear, I think, on that. Uh, there's uh, four calls to action, including the United Nations Declaration here on records and archival policies and practices. And what happens to the records that we have put forward? What happens to the stories 
that our seniors and our elders told that went to residential school, the survivors. Uh, we need to know that there's compliance with what we want and who owns those records and who gets to actually distribute them. Uh, we have also been able to go to the Vatican City and get records there to bring them back to the National Center. So there are more records that actually prove, although we did lose the case and we're still sort of sitting in stasis on whether or not all of those records from the independent assessment process should be destroyed, or can be kept by the National Center and, and put away for 100 years or whatever you know, we wanted to agree to. So there's some questions here that are important that I think we should be aware of. Uh, the missing children, there are six calls to action on missing children and provision of records and documents and resources to, to finish this death registry, which we have been working on. Uh, one of the arguments right now is that uh, the government of Canada has hired a, um, an outside agency to work on this uh, from the Netherlands, the, uh, I think it's called the International Commission of Missing Persons. So we were not happy about that because they did not ask anybody uh, at the National Center about it. They did not ask Kim Murray, who is a special interlocutor on missing children and grave sites. And so there's a bit of a, a schmazzle there and it feels very much like the federal government uh, still doesn't really take into consideration our opinion on what should happen with with all of these very important circumstances. Uh, the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation, there's two calls to action in keeping this this going. This is the flag that they put together for the Every Child Matters. Um, it's an important one, and um, they have funded it for $10 million over the next seven years, as was in the, in the calls to action. But again, um, there needs to be more resources put here they are working on the missing children and on mark graves and um, there's some yeah there's some sorting out that has to happen to ensure that the national center has has a say and that the chiefs and the survivors are at the table the survivors in particular need to be at the table so it's an important consideration and conversation this one is uh, there's commemoration. So there's five calls to action on commemoration. And this is about developing a framework for Canadian heritage and historic sites and commemorative monuments. So again, an important consideration for all of you, monies are in, put in place to be able to commemorate the loss of these children. And, and I think it's important uh, that we access that resource and we use it to good effect. It's an important one. Um, the three calls, there are three calls to action on media and reconciliation. And again, it's about increasing Indigenous programming, APTN and other kinds of radio, TV, all that kind of stuff. And also educating journalists to do a better job of actually reporting on the things that are happening in our communities. We don't like to see it all be negative. There are some really amazing things going on in our communities. And I think that that should be taken into consideration. There are five calls to action on sports. And this is telling the story of Indigenous athletes in history, amending acts and policies and provide sta providing stable funding to the Indigenous games and to youth because our kids want to be engaged in hockey and other sports. And in many communities and for many families, that's not possible because we're still up against poverty in our communities. We're still up against uh, a lack of resources to move these kinds of things forward. So another really important consideration as we move forward. And there are, uh, is one call to action for business. Uh, and again, that's about asking them to adopt the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People and apply its principles to everything they do. And we know that this is also a challenge because of the Ring of Fire and Doug Ford's insistence that we open it up. And he hired uh, the Australia, an Australian company that, that destroyed many of the Aborigine uh, artifacts and, and caves without, uh, oh, sorry. So we don't want that kind of thing happening here. So we need to really keep a sharp eye on uh, what's happening with the businesses because that's an important consideration for our future. And then finally, I think the last one is two calls to action on newcomers to Canada. And we have actually dealt with this because it has been very important for us to do so. Um, we have actually uh, contributed to bringing back and putting into the conversation on immigrants, the Canadian story, our story, which was taken out by the Harper government. It's now back in place. And so we've had done everything we possibly can to ensure that, uh, that that's part of the conversation. So I wanna go on to from there to, um, I'm sorry we just don't stop in the middle of everything, but those are important considerations for us to think about. Those are the foundations of the conversations we are going to be having for, in a lot of very important areas over the next 
two decades or more. I don't think we're going to get to reconciliation in my lifetime, but hey, you never know. Uh, but we're going to now talk about, I just want to introduce the principles of the universities across Canada. Uh, they were tabled by the presidents of the, of the universities across Canada, and there are 13 of them. And I, they're important because actually they feel very much like something we as, indig as Indigenous peoples in our own education systems should be looking at. Um, because they talk about commitment, the curriculum development, leadership potential, and, and also sharing that ability, resources and how important they are, partnerships, because we often can use other people's uh, assistance as we move forward, sharing of information, because we can't do this in a vacuum, it has to be, we, we, like, we all need to help each other, because we all have all kinds of really smart people in our communities that have the ability to do a lot of this, uh, a lot of this work. We want to have some greater exposure on the work that we're trying to do especially when it comes to the children that we um, have that are special you know to us and, and need some special considerations we want to put some resources there uh, intercultural engagement because our kids have to live in the world I mean that's what um, Fred Wheatley said you know you have to live in the world in which you find yourself and to do that that means that we have to have that intercultural engagement and confidence our kids have to be confident that they can actually do it I still remember being at Thunder Bay at the high schools and kids come in with their hoodies they come in as a pod sit down at the back, they listen, they get up as a pod and they leave together and they don't actually in, in, engage with other students at the university at all. And I think we need to have the ability to have that engagement and still be ourselves, but just have that engagement. And then he, they also talk about the role of institutions from K to 12. So I think that's important. So think about it in the context of the of you know education on a larger scale and where we want it to go. But also think about it in the context of what we want to do as we move through these webinars and we move through the work in our communities. So we want to ensure commitment at every level to develop opportunities for our students. We want it to be student centered. We want to focus on the learners and the learning outcomes and their abilities which could be musical, it could be artistic, it could be, um, you know, trees, it could be plant, uh, hunting, it could be all kinds of things. It doesn't have to be A's. We want to create opportunities that promote their success. We want to recognize the importance of indigenization of curricula through responsiveness from the communities, right? We want to support programs, orientations, and, and teaching ways, not just the one single way, but what about our elders? What about our mothers? What about our grandmothers? We want, want to recognize the importance of Indigenous education leadership. So they need representation at the governance level. So that could mean actually uh, shadowing our chiefs and councils so that they get an opportunity to go to these events and learn what is happening at that level. And this is these are the these are the pre presidents, but it, it it suits us as well. Building welcoming and respectful learning environments through the implementation of programs and support mechanisms and spaces dedicated to those students. So they feel comfortable going into a school. It is their school and it has all the kinds of things that make it a place where they want to go. Developing resources, spaces and approaches that promote dialogue between Indigenous and non-Indigenous students. So maybe doing some uh, like the Canadian Roots did, you know, just doing some exchanges so that they get accustomed to going to the high school and they get accustomed to coming to the reserve and they, you know start to get rid of the mythology behind everybody and, and, and the way they see each other. Developing accessible learning environments off campus so people feel comfortable as well doing that. Recognizing the value of promoting partnerships among educational and local indigenous communities. We need to build bridges between our schools and the you know, trade centers and the uh, colleges and the high schools so that the, the back and forth is not so strange, especially in remote communities or northern communities. And collaborate on the specific needs of our students. Build on successful experiences and initiatives in place at universities, certainly, but also in our own communities. What are we, what are we doing that's so amazing and helping our kids? I know that still in the north, we've got issues around kids going back to school after the pandemic. Uh, some schools, 60% of the kids are still not going to school. How do we get them back in the school and make it a place that they want to go to? Uh, sharing information is going to be important and, and letting students know, you know, there's not only doctors, nurses and policemen, that there's all kinds of other programs and supports that are available to them in engineering. And I, I talked to a lot of organizations and institutions that would like to see pathways built to their to the kind of work that they do. And then recognizing the importance of providing greater exposure and knowledge for non-Indigenous students on who we are and what we do. So again, that exchange process. 
fostering intercultural engagement and recognizing the role that we that our schools um, the role they play in creating enabling and supportive environments for successful and high quality K to 12 experiences for our kids. So that's what they're saying, but it's also very much, I think, about what we what we also need to say ourselves. So what we're going to go through now is um, I'm going to try to let you digest that for a few minutes. <laughs> Again, you can come back to these and watch these as often as you want. I'm trying to lay down a foundation of some very, you know, very sort of technical things, but we wanted to start with making sure that you had the, you know, that opportunity. So I want to go to also some questions. I'm going to go share my screen again and, uh, and start to come to those questions. And these are the things that we actually also want to talk about here uh, with you is, you know, the, when we start to indigenize curriculum, we don't want to make it so, so complicated that it's so hard for you to actually do. We want to think about what do we need to do? What do we need to what do we need to make possible that which looks impossible? You know, whether it's about, you know, resources for curriculum, whether it's about getting people into the classroom, those are sometimes those things look pretty impossible. And I, I have taught in a northern school and I and I know the feeling. But let's start thinking about those kinds of things. What do we need to make possible that looks that that which looks impossible? Who needs to be involved? And I, I, this is a bit of like about asset mapping. You know, this is asset mapping your entire community and looking at all of the institutions, organizations, and spaces and places that people inhabit. You know, the, the individuals, families, community, you know, the politicians, the churches, you know, the, the seniors' residences, if you have one, uh, the school itself. Where is everybody and who can be drawn out of those places to do the kinds of things that we need to do when we talk about education and especially, you know, education for our, our kids that need a very different kind of an approach, you know, on the land or whatever. How do we, how do we asset map that and, and sit down and do that? And, and that's something that you can do in your own community. What are the roles and responsibilities of everybody? One of the things that I know for sure is it's very, very hard for people to come to, um, a meeting or come to a conversation if they're not if they don't walk away with something to do you know okay I sat here I listened now what do I do you know what's 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 important to me now so you know that's what we need to start to think about as we move forward what are those roles and responsibilities and what can we ask people to do even if it just means uh, collecting pictures of uh, past education situations uh, whether it's uh, you know talking to each other about uh, the, the things that they can bring to the table and then where and when does it happen? You know, we've talked a little bit about creating these spaces for students that are maybe not a classroom per se because they've dropped out, but how do we create a space where they'll come together and we can actually have conversations about other ways of getting them educated, alternative mechanisms to get people into spaces where they're learning and feel comfortable and taking stock of what we've already done. Because I know you guys have done some amazing work already. Um, this is just a conversation to start to draw in more people into helping you because we don't want anybody to burn out. And then finally, what are the ways in which it, it uh, the ways in which it happens or how do we do it and make it stick? You know, and I think that that's an important consideration because, again, the consideration piece is important because it, the stickiness is every time a government changes, every time a government changes, we end up losing a great deal because that government then takes, you know, stops the kind the heavy work that we've already done, the heavy lifting that's already happened is now undone. And I think that that's something that we don't want to have happen that work of indigenization requires a commitment and I, and again it, you know from everyone not just those of you that have been hired to do this work but everybody that is a part of this if we're nation building that means it's everybody so we have to take measures at restoring renewing and regenerating indigenous practices what kinds of educations are going to bring kids into this conversation you know the use of language and we all, I mean, that's how my daughter learned to speak Ojibwe as, as, as much as she can from actually spending time with elders and just sitting and beating and doing other kinds of things, uh, doing uh, crafts and, and, and little tasks that actually opened up the opportunity to have these conversations. And we can talk about that, like having elders teas where the teas, the elders are sitting with the tea and the cookies and the, and the students roam around actually sitting down with them and having a cookie with them and having a conversation about the past or about their life. And being and doing, you know, all of the stuff that's important to a community as they start that. So 
So those questions are kind of the foundations for the larger conversation and inviting voices from the community into the dialogue. And I know how hard that is. I mean, trust me, I try to get parents into the classrooms, but maybe we just have to change our approach in terms of, you know, as we talk about nation building and the kinds of things that we're trying to do, you know, we have to confirm every single child in our community even if they're in a space right now where there's there's addictions is exceptional extraordinary extraordinary in their own way and the educational system in in our communities has to demonstrate our realities right it has to start to create that flexibility that allows these kids an opportunity um, to, to come in maybe it, it's a night school thing i don't know but you know figuring out ways that we can do that language restoration um, i remember being in muskrat dam and and uh, they had every day once a week was a la language only day. And they always hated to see me coming because I didn't speak OG Cree. <laughs> and they'd be like, you're Cynthia Hyde. You know, so they, because you paid five bucks if you didn't, if you, you paid five bucks if somebody caught you speaking English on that particular day. And those monies went into a pot that actually provided some, uh, you know, additional resources for students. So different kinds of ways to do that. And I also want to say, because I think it's really important we're not trying to throw out anything. The three R's, the reading, writing, arithmetic, those are the basics and those will stay in place. What we're saying is, can we create a basket that hosts all of the cultural imperatives that we want, the rites of passage, you know, the, the, the small ceremonies to tell our kids, you know, how much we care about them, you know, and the learning of language in various ways and, and you know, the crafts, if that's what they want to do, but also the reading, writing and arithmetic that, they're, that, they, that they need to move forward. And unless, you know, and I'll say this, I mean, unless there's a student in the, in the classroom, and I've had those students, that you just kind of go, this child should not be in school. This kid knows the language, he feeds the elders, he knows the traditions, take him out of school, give him to the elders, let them school him, because it's the academic system is not for him. But when all the other kids come back after going to academic institutions, he will be holding the culture for them. And I know, you know, down in the South, that would be an, almost an impossibility, but you have kids that have dropped out at 16, maybe they can be given to the elders, or, or it could be set up so that they can then be taken out on the land to do the sweats, to do the vision questing, to do the work, and they can become your next culture holders. I mean, you know, rather than just saying, oh, like, you don't know what to do with that kid, but finding a way to bring them back into the circle so that they feel more confident about what they're doing. And I, you know, I just, I know, I know it's challenging. We've come a huge way, but we have more work to do. Okay, so I'm going to go through the, I'm going to try very hard to go through the, I've got about 20 minutes or more. I'm going to try to go through the, uh, the, the relevant calls to action for these particular webinars. So they're numbered. I'm going to number them. There's like they're numbered six because it's six. There was five. The first five are child welfare. Starting with six um, is education. And the first one is we call upon the government of Canada to repeal section 43 of the criminal code. Now, section 43 of the criminal code is controversial because it offers parents and teachers a defense when they use reasonable force to discipline a child. So those opposed to repealing it see it as an unwanted intrusion by government into a teacher's and parent's right to decide what's best. But I also know that there's many memories within our population of unfettered disciplinary actions that left deep scars in our population. So, you know, this is an important one. And I think it's really important because we've kind of been pushed into this place where we use disciplinary actions that are that, you know, we never did in the beginning. You know, historically, Indigenous peoples did not spank or physically assault or punish their children. They used force or they, they did not use force, sorry, they did not use force to get children to listen or, you know, that question of behave, because we wanted children to know that we did, what, what we wanted them to know, we demonstrated through our actions, you know, and I've said that if you, if you don't model what you're teaching, then you're teaching something else. You know, if you tell kids don't smoke, it's bad for you, but you're sitting there with a cigarette, you're saying to them, it's okay. If it's okay for you, mom, dad, uncle Fred, it's okay for me. So, you know, we understand the use of force to be a legacy effect from the residential school period and earlier influences of missionaries who brought us the spare the rod, spoil the child way of thinking. 
So it has done more damage than good as far as I'm concerned. We can teach and embed traditional ways of child re rearing, which uh, engage observation and really understanding and knowing that child, hands-on experience, getting them out of the house and doing things that are absolutely useful to them. Um, observing animal behaviors. We, we've forgotten that we at one time had very much an interaction with those animals and them with us. And in fact, I see so many instances now of animals coming to people for assistance and actually people actually engaging on, on lots of levels to, to help them. Learning through doing, you know, and, I, and we've taken a lot of that away from our, our kids and community by not having the opportunity to chop wood or to do those kinds of things that help them build strength, physical strength, emotional strength, mental strength, you know, and, and even spiritual strength, don't do it, right? So when, even when children don't complete a task that they're given, it, that we still can be encouraging and supportive as caregivers, that we, you know, our, our tempers are not short. And I know that some of these short tempers are, are about some of the legacy effect from residential schools and other kinds of uh, discriminatory things that have happened over the course of time. But again, our consciousness is really important here. So we, it takes a new consciousness that we parent very deliberately rather than from damaged emotional experiences and fear. Like we just have to know, you know, I've said that to people before, you know, you're, you're doing saying something to your child and you go that, you know, you're da, 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 da. And then you're like, mom, and then no, but it's you, right? You've transferred that over to what you're doing with your kids. So we know we have work to do. I have work to do. We all we all have to do what we can to create those restorative practices that engage the entire family community and engage the knowledge of our elders or olders as some of the guys in my community. I don't want to call them elders, so I call them olders. Um, and that's where we talk about the question of wise practices. What did we do? How did we tell those stories? And how did we use respite care and support in the days when we didn't have the kind of access we have now to computers and technologies and the kinds of things that keep people really separated? So we need to go back and redefine, and I know it's probably different for each community, uh, but we need to redefine traditional Indigenous child rearing. And, you know, talked a little bit non-interference. Non-interference doesn't mean that you let your kids run amok, that they do whatever they want. Non-interference means when you see your child trying to achieve something, that you allow them the, the privilege of making it or not making it. And that you you provide the assistance when they when they are are the are the applause when they're successful, and you apply the assistance when they're not if they if they ask you to that they let you let, allow them the ability the, the the privilege of learning. Um, no permissiveness. Permissiveness has caused some problems. It, the permissiveness is not the same as 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 um, you know having gentle boundaries. Um, we sometimes feel scared to say no to our kids because we think it's going to make it worse. But in fact, kids want boundaries that are in place that expand as they grow older, not just whatever you want to do. Uh, family structures have changed. We have single parents. We have absent fathers. You know, we have suicide, uh, a lot of suicide in the north, not so much in the south. But it, it, when they see a lot of it, it seems to feels like it becomes an option and they, they are aware of it. And that's a problem. Intrusive media, drugs and violences in our communities, uh, neglect, family separations, poverty, food insecurity, which we're, I think, working on. And of course, there's just outside work that we do. We travel. And I still remember as a young woman uh, being in a conversation, I think it was during the Beach Lake Accord conversations. Uh, and one of the chiefs from BC got up and said, I'm here today. Um, I'm grieving. My, I, I just lost my son. He was 23. I think he was 23. Um, he said, I have worked my entire life for the Indigenous community. My people, I've worked every day for them. I've missed hockey games. I miss birthday parties. I miss family gatherings. And now my son is dead. If you have children, put your attention and time and care there. And I remember thinking, oh, let's see, I'm going home because I had a little, a little kids at home. And I still remember actually another woman saying to me, you know, I want to be an activist. I want to be able to save the people. I want to be able to work for them. And I said to the, my first words out of my mouth were, how do you have children? And she said, yes. And I said, how old are your children? And she said, two and three. And I said, go home and raise your kids first. They need you more than anybody else. So. Uh, number seven, uh, call, we call upon the federal government to develop with Aboriginal groups a joint strategy to eliminate educational employment gaps. Uh, laying the groundwork for a joint strategy has to come from us. The joint part is internal work initially. So we come to the table prepared with a plan of action and give the government our request, our demand, or whatever you want to call it for financial and legislative, if desired, support. We do it. If we don't do the groundwork, we put it in the hands of the federal 
provincial bureaucracy to propose action to us. So our job is to remember that we want our children to know what we want our children to know and learn and guide them into professions and skill sets that build community and nations and celebrate who we are, not how we compete with non-Indigenous communities or Canadians. Their goals and our goals are not compatible in very many areas. So we have to clearly determine what is our future going to look like 10 years from now, 50 years from now, and the skill sets and knowledges that will get us there. If we want our children to return to our communities, then we begin from birth, setting the picture of our, of our future nation and observing all of the children and being aware of their skills and directing them into fields they will excel at because of the natures that they have. You know, are they peacekeepers? Are they, do they like to get into trouble? You know, how do we direct them? You know, are they the people who are, are, are the soothers? They, they start, they're the healers. They, they help everybody. You know, we need to start thinking about who are our children and how do we actually take care of them in a way that's going to, you know, pull their gifts forward and ensure that they don't need to get into drugs and alcohol and violences. So what do we need? We need to, act, we need access to traditional foods for sure and get our kids off that stuff that's not even food uh, we need to maybe we're teaching you know i think we're all teaching you hunting and fishing i'm sure but not everybody we need horticulture uh, or ways of doing aquaculture in our communities so that we can extend the periods of food growth you know we need we, i know sometimes it's short we live in canada it's cold but we there are there ways and my daughter's just starting a garden with her daughter and um she's going to start to teach her how to grow different foods and and, and cook She's three. <laughs> so we all need children, you know, we need children to have a sense of business and budgets. And so we're going to learn ourselves about how to manage monetary issues and what is money and how and in, in, in those who work with their hands, we're going to help them move in that direction, whether they're carpenters, house builders. We need alternative heating systems in our communities. You know, we need we need engineers. We need forest managers. We need people who, who do water, who are aqua specialists, uh, you know, with biologists. We need government specialists. We need child well-being experts, child well-being experts, not people who go into CAS. And we need family supports and respite care. So, you know, we need palliative care. We need so many things. We have children who don't know what to do. We have children now in in, that are in communities that have university uh, degrees that don't know what to do with that. So we can't have that. If we're going to educate them. We need to bring them home and give them and ensure that we've got something for them that's going to be specifically about what, they, what they've now learned. So that whole question of lack of sufficient funding for on reserve, well, it hasn't been addressed adequately, but you know, we're going to get there. I think we all need to stand up and, and talk loud and shout loud. Number eight is we call upon the federal government to eliminate the discrepancy in federal education funding for First Nations children being educated on reserves and those being educated off reserves. Uh, the 21, 2021 stats tell me that um, the school, Ontario schools, um, that our kids are going uh, to on reserve, off reserve schools and are doing better. In Ontario, and as in most provinces, the vast majority of First Nations, Métis and Inuit students attend provincially funded schools. And, um, and that information comes out of a solid foundation, second progress report on Ontario First Nations and Métis Inuit framework. Well, those statistics tell us that there is an inequity in funding and education needs remain in our First Nation communities, especially for extraordinary children who require exceptional teachers and programs to ensure they have appropriate and sustained opportunities like any child. But it is telling us that our kids are doing better off reserve than on reserve. So that's why, you know, I think we need to, you know, our schools are better. But I don't know if they're actually as bad as 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 much um, as well as they should be. Lots of statistical reports, uh, the majority of which demonstrate there's a lot of work to do within our communities, and confirm the interference of external forces doesn't help. So it can't be done by outside education consultants. It has to be done by us. Uh, that conference that was hosted, our time, our health, time to reconnect, restore, and refocus. I don't want to come off as, as harsh, but it's 2023 and we still have more than 50% of our kids in some form of care. So who's educating them? What are they learning? And where will they end up? We don't want them to end up in jail. So this sense of urgency, you know, especially now at my age, I've been doing this work for 50 years. I know we can do this. I can see it being done, but we just need to dig a little deeper and commit a little harder and bring more people into the conversation. Uh, nine is we call upon the federal government to prepare and publish annual reports comparing funding for the education of First Nations children on, on and off reserves 
as well as educational income attainments of Aboriginal people in Canada compared with non-Aboriginal people. Yeah, well, I'm not always happy that that's the case um, because I think there's better statistical numbers that we can look at. But those numbers um, tell us that those who do not live on reserve um, do better. So there's more to thinking about how we define our own successes. Uh, what is a success in our First Nation communities? Let's define that in ways that make some sense to us as First Nations uh, Métis people. Like, how do we do this? And how does it relate to Canadian society? I don't know if that really matters. It, you know, it, should we be looking at Canadian society as a, as, a, as a measure? I don't know. They measure income to income education levels to education levels. But is that what we really want to measure? I, I, I think that there are other ways to measure the success of our own people and still acknowledge that we've been forced from a land-based econ land based economy to cash-based economy, which just doesn't suit everybody. I think there are other ways to look at the arts and the music and the talents and the writing and the, and the skill sets of our kids that isn't about how many A's did they get or how many B's did they get, but really, you know, what kind of a human being are they and how does that, how do we grow that human being into the kind of human being that's going to be the nation in the future? So we have to make choices about where we go from here and what kinds of successes we're going to be celebrating into the future. This includes those artistic and musical initiatives, language, storytelling initiatives, land-based learning, teaching, and things that make sense to the places, practices, and needs of Indigenous peoples where they are. We don't want everybody to just constantly be moving. You know, I appreciate that we're constantly in transition. We've been forced into constant motion that isn't always physical, but has deep consequences in emotional, mental, and spiritual contexts. You know, we have to be thinking about all that. You know, I've talked about how we're kind of up in our heads and what we really need to incorporate the entire body because we've been backed into that proverbial corner on education and governance and other things. I, I know I've worked on governance for many years. I've worked on land claims for many years. I've worked on research for many years, and I've certainly worked on education. So I know that, you know, that being backed into corner is, is, is a, is a hard place to be, but we are now coming out of the corner. We can create transformation because we do have the power. We have the rights. And like you, I don't want to watch any more destruction. I don't want to see or hear about more suicides and more hurt in our gen in our young in our general population, but especially for our kids. Number ten is we call on the federal government to draft new Aboriginal uh, education legislation with the full participation and informed consent of, of, of Aboriginal peoples. So there, it's supposed to commit to sufficient funding and incorporate the following principles: it's providing sufficient funding to those identified educational achievement gaps within one generation. I, we haven't got there. Improving education attainment levels and success rates, somewhat, somewhat. Developing cultural appropriate curricula. We're working on it. I think the universities are doing a better job, but we're working on it. There are some mandates now to have residential school teachings, but that has to be age appropriate. Uh, protecting the right to Aboriginal languages, including the teaching of languages as credit courses. Some instances, yes. Enabling parental and community responsibility, control, and accountability, similar to what parents enjoy in public systems. That is really on us. I don't expect anybody external to us to get parents and communities and members into the schools and helping to ensure that kids have the kinds of educations that we want them to have. Um, enabling parents to participate in the education of their children. Come on, come on now. We need you as to be a part of this, to be in the classrooms and to help work that system when they get home so that they don't just bug out at three o'clock. We need to have that real commitment from parents and respecting and honoring treaty relationships. And we've been working on that. So important call to action. We've waited and waited for the federal government to meet its obligation. It hasn't happened in hundreds of years. So what are we waiting for? It's not gonna happen. So if we really want it to change, we have to make that change ourselves and enliven it in our schools, in our schools, on reserve in particular. We give kudos and gratitudes to those who've taken this up and created curriculum for language, cultural knowledges. And I believe if we all contribute something more, time, expertise, money, we can broaden the scope. We can do this. If we're going to indigenize our education, protect the identities and realities of our children, we have work to do. One of the initial questions and what this means to each community is, is what is indigenized and how do we see it being applied? So there's another definitions exercise there. We have to start to think about traditional child rearing, indigenized, what does it mean? What does it look like? What does it smell like? What does it feel like? 
We've strayed from the path of our ancestors who did things together and for the people. So we've lived, divide, and conquer for a very long time because of what's happened with uh, the colonial process. So to return to the teachings, we have to reconstitute the dish with one spoon because that said we are allies and we know that when somebody's in trouble, we can, we, you know, they can come to our territory and we can go to theirs and we can be okay. So we, we, you know, when we're faced with crisis, shortages, or challenges, we know that we have each other. We constitute the dish with one spoon. Um, the Indian Act and this question of reservationization has created some seemingly insurmountable barriers. So instead of maintaining what we regard as inferiorized communities across Canada, artificial communities, let's turn it into some reality for ourselves. The journey to collaboration, sustainability, self-determination, and the making of what a Canada that does with Indigenous peoples rather than two or four has to be our first order of business as scholars and community members of all ages and backgrounds. We yeah, it's ours. We can develop culturally appropriate curricula by sharing verbally and actioning traditional values and beliefs. We have it in us, gifted by teachers who've carried forward cultural knowledges to reinstate our value systems, our child care, education, social structures. The government of Canada is never going to do this for us and is ne never intended to do it for us and may never participate in meaningful ways because it's not in their interest to do so. You know, the, the, just, you know, just trying to get students to return to the classroom after pandemic and post-COVID rates of return, we need to somehow help make that happen. Maybe also organizations like Teach for Canada and others that are looking at how to get the kinds of teachers into our communities that we need and are getting our own teachers out of the people that are doing uh, classroom work now and getting them back into school where they are, not making them leave the community to go somewhere else. So I, I, you know, we live on lands that hold important keys to our own economic viability, and we have to remember this and move forward accordingly. We're not being held hostage now by anything but our collective histories, traumas, and unresolved grief, which can be healed when we take a very deliberate and conscious step forward as a collective, not independently. We have to help each other. Oh, do we ever have to work together? So capacity to hold others accountable through the myriad documentations is ours. There's legislation, there's acts, there's legal cases now, and there's RCAP, there's the 94 calls to action, there's the United Nations uh, Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, and there is now public opinion, something we did not have before. So we call upon the number 11 is we call upon the federal government to provide adequate funding to end the backlog of First Nations students seeking a post-secondary education. And this is supposed to be happening um, in the 2016-17 school year. School boards were to receive $64 million to support First Nation Métis and Inuit education. And it was divided into five categories. So again, um, you guys are the recipients thereof, so this is the place where you can confirm or not confirm, and if you didn't get it, then we need to talk about, you know, how. So the native la language allocation was, was almost 10 million, 9.9 .9 million. The First Nations May Teen Inuit Studies allocation was 24.8 million. Per pupil amount allocation was 23.4, and the board action plans allocation was $6 million. Uh, for the first time, the Ministry of Education included funding in the basic per pupil allocation, which school boards were required to use to, to establish a supervisory officer level position focused on the implementation of the education policy framework. And responsibilities were to include working with First Nations, Métis, Inuit communities, organizations, students, and families, uh, supporting programs to build the knowledge and awareness of all students about Indigenous histories, cultures, perspectives, and contributions, and supporting implementation of Indigenous self-identification policies in each board. So the boards were not only required to spend at least half of the target amount on this dedicated position, but also confirm that any remaining amounts would be used to support First Nation Métis and Inuit education frameworks. And the last one is uh, we call upon the federal, provincial, territorial, and Aboriginal governments to develop culturally appropriate early childhood education programs and some of the quick facts for that from 2018 are, and I, again, did they do it? I mean, you know, nobody, you know, I haven't seen a report card yet. I, I think there may be, I was looking for one. If one, one of you has it, perfect. Ontario supported Indigenous children and their families by investing up to 70 million over two years in childcare and child and family programs developed in partnership with municipal service managers and Indigenous organizations. Ontario invested 11.5 million in upgrades and enhancement to the First Nation School of Toronto. In 2018, uh, Ontario invested $784 million in 79 new and renovated schools across the province. 
uh, and, and established 2,700 new licensed childcare spaces for children aged zero to four. They invested 1.6 billion in new capital funds for over five years, ending to 2023 now, to support the creation of 45,000 new licensed childcare spaces in schools, other public spaces and communities. So, you know, there's some research is showing us that there's some positive relationships between quality early childhood learning, child development outcomes, and parent a parent's ability to work. So those all fit together, I think. And in 2021, the Ontario government's work made a further commitment to ensure. First Station Métis Nino perspectives are reflected throughout the provincial province's curriculum. So it, curriculum development continued on, even though Doug Ford put a stop to it, it still kept going. And obviously the uh, Ministry of Education said, nah, we're gonna keep doing this. So the province's curriculum now includes mandatory learning and social studies, grade four to six, history in grade seven, uh, eight and 10, and mandatory learning on residential schools in grades eight and 10, which was introduced in 2018. And finally, um, the ministry in 2023, the Ministry of Education announced a commitment to complete the full spectrum of learning across this elementary curriculum, addressing current gaps in grades one and three by September 2023. So that should be ongoing. This timeline in the curriculum development process is being co-developed with Indigenous partners. Again, you know that may be you to reflect in, uh, in reflect meaningful collaboration while recognizing the urgency of this content and learning. And the province announced in 2021 that these changes will further strengthen mandatory learning in, on residential schools and greater understanding about the intergenerational legacy uh, borne by Indigenous families. So we hope that that is actually happening. And so that's their first, second phase, uh, the Truth Reconciliation Commission calls to action. Uh, the first phase was implemented in 2018. And so now we're moving into that second phase. And there's obviously more that is going on in the context of, of, of monies that have been allocated to this learning opportunity. So we're hopeful that it, that, it, that, 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 it, that is in fact happening. And all the way through, I mean, there's numbers that I can, education grants that are available for student needs, uh, $97 million to bring that you know, up and, and to close those gaps. Um, Grand Council Treaty 3 signed a memorandum of understanding on first night to education and received $300,000 to create meaningful supports. So it's a matter also, I guess, making that application and putting those proposals forward. There's reciprocal education agreements that are coming into effect that were uh, signed off in 2019 and are supposedly collaborative. Those are coming forward. And then, uh, you know, I think that the whole point is uh, animating the voices and experiences of, of everyone and integrating them into the education process creates a new, more balanced center and a fresh vantage point from which to analyze Eurocentric education and its pedagogies that we're trying to actually change these questions to as we as we move forward. I don't know. Are we going to be able to actually make it make it so? I'm 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 very hopeful that we can actually do that because that's going to be the part that gets us to where we're going to go. So I'm going to leave it here. And, um, I want to, you know, this is a lot to throw at you, I know, but there's, it, it's, it's like when I'm talking to non-Indigenous people, I'm always saying, this is a huge story. There's so much going on that really doesn't get to the light of day or is not in the public domain. So it's a challenge. But I want to say there's lots of scholars, Indigenous scholars, especially, who've commented on and written about these changes for Indigenous peoples, including the change from the negative to really looking at the positive. It doesn't have to be all about how bad it is. It can move to the fact that there are some very good things happening in our in our communities and our places. So as we move forward, the so this is kind of done. It's a lot, it may, but it's important. It's the foundations. And we'll carry the conversation up and forward, I hope, and, 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 and prompt you to think about and rethink present circumstances that you're working with. And, and I want you guys to ask questions and answers that can be answered by people that are in, in, this, in this circle so that everybody's playing a part, because I know you're all doing some amazing stuff. And then we want to further action um, this stuff for our kids and make sure that they are in, 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 in very good places. So that's kind of the, the, the huge background that we had. Um, what I want to do um, is now take a five minute break and then come back. And then we'll, you know, we'll have a conversation. We'll spend as much time as we possibly can having that conversation. There's about 45 minutes, 40 minutes 
of, of time to just uh, comment, um, ask some questions, make some suggestions. We have reading lists that are going to go out to you. Um, you may have that already or it'll be posted. Um, there's some articles and videos, different kinds of things that I'll be posting. And then they'll, they'll go onto the website so that you can take a look at them. And then, uh, yeah, and then we'll start to figure out how do we bring people together into this conversation. Okay, so let's see. It's now 11, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. So let's come back at 11, 20. And then we'll 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 have the opportunity to have a conversation. All right, I'll leave it there. Eleven twenty. Okay.
Hello. Where, who have I got? Pat, you back? I am here. <laughs> okay, that was a lot. Um, but it is just the foundations. And so, you know, and, and it just says there was a question about uh, being able to take notes and that everything will be posted for you. So we're going to post the PowerPoint, we're going to post the text, you know, and then and, and they've already got that material. We're also going to post a book list that uh, has that's broken into categories for you as well. So, you know, if you want to know more about adoption, you want to know more about education, you want to know more about traditional practices, you know, everything is put into, you know, those places so that it's easy for you to access and, and take a look. Um, I know books, you know, are a challenge in some places, uh, getting books, um, reading <laughs> is sometimes a challenge. Um, you know, not everybody's parents were big readers. I, my parents were big readers. So I do a lot. I did, you know, it was easy for me to do a lot of reading, um, but not everybody's like that, but we're encouraging it. That's part of the early childhood education piece is actually getting books that are of real interest to children. And I have a, you know, my, my granddaughter's not quite three. She's just heading into three and, um, yeah, she loves books. So, you know, we, I, I think uh, uh, Bartleman, James Bartleman, you know, when he was uh, as Le Lieutenant Governor, made a real effort to get books into First Nation communities across Canada. He, he really dedicated a lot of books to libraries. But books are really an important part of uh, peeking into somebody else's mind that you don't necessarily know. So, okay, so questions are, are, are comments. Um, let's, let's try to get something up and because I want to know a couple things. Pat, Patricia and I have talked about how these webinars will fall out. We don't have to spend the whole, you know, two hours. We set aside two hours because we would like to have some guest speakers as well. So I have um, Bobby Joe Virtue, who does policy work, will come in probably on what webinar two, so next week. Uh, Steve Copti, who is a uh, MSW and is a social worker in remote community, is going to come in on webinar four to talk a little bit about you know what he's observing and the kinds of things that he he feels are important for us to to start to a dialogue about and we want to know you know more or less um what's really critical for you as individuals as chiefs as as uh, as leaders uh as teachers as students what do you want us to really focus in on. I know the next time we're going to look sort of at the background that flex learning and, and elders and on the land teachings, but maybe there's something else. I know that the um, at the health conference, um, the question of opioid addiction was raised in a very direct way, you know, that, you know, I think um, I, I can't remember his name, but he said like something like 80% of the of the people in his community are addicted to opioids. Um, they don't go on the, they won't go on the land, they won't go um, to other places to get help because they, oh, he said, you know, he very graphically, he said, the, the only thing they'll do is go as far as the length of their arm, because that's where their source is for the drugs that they feel they need. And that means that on the land teachings are not even really, it's not that they're not important, it's this that they're not being utilized. So if you have some suggestions, and there were some, some suggestions to where he could go look for some strategies in community, um, let me share with you that, uh, and I'd like you to share with me. So, you know, start putting into the chat. When I was in um, Old Crow, Northwest Territories, um, uh, they had very difficult, they're very small community, about 60 houses, very small. Um, um, they said on Friday, Saturday, well, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, basically, uh, the community was in an uproar because that's when people would drink. So kids are roaming around the community looking for a safe space to go and afraid for their lives because they don't know what, you know, they, they, they're running. Um, so people are taking them in. And they said it happens every week, week after week after week, year after year after year, and they, and they were very, and the elders were very tired of it. Now, they haven't been on in, in settlement for very long, but probably... Last, certainly 60 years at least 70 years so not that long our lifetimes that they've been in settlement and off the land but anyway I said to them well what happens on Monday and Tuesday night and Wednesday night and they said well nothing it's quiet and I said well those are the nights that you need to go talk to people that are drinking on Thursday Friday and Saturday those are the nights that you need to have a conversation and then on Thursday nights you need to put up a, because it was wintertime when I was up there, you need to put up a barbecue, uh, like a fire, 
and invite the kids and bring hot dogs and or whatever. Not no more sugar because sugar is really bad for you. But or even hot dogs are bad for you. But bring something that they can cook, and and tea and po- tea porridge and put it around the um, put it around the uh, fire and invite the kids. And then they said to me, "Yeah, but the, the, but they they won't come." And I said, "It doesn't matter whether they come. You're going to do it every every. You're going to do it every every week. You're going to do it anyway." And you're going to do it. And then you're going to go do it on Friday. You're going to do Thursdays, 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 Friday, Thursday, Friday, and then Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And trust me, people will come. Because right now they're, they're stuck in a rut of just, you know, every Friday, Saturday, you know, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, then we get drunk. And that's what we're used to. Find another way to give them something else to think about and do. And so, you know, they, you know, that's, you know, so it, it, they were like, oh, <laughs> it's not it's not there's anything wrong with them they just you know it without they're so stuck in it and sometimes we get stuck in these situations and that we can't see anything outside of it so giving you know it's the only thing that um president clinton ever said that i remembered he said it's not enough to tell people to say no and that was the drug uh, nancy reagan uh, just say no uh drug uh thing he said, it's not enough to tell people to say no. You have to give them something to say yes to when they get up in the morning. And that made a lot of sense to me. Give them something to say yes to when they get up in the morning. So any questions or, or, or other kinds of thoughts? Um, you want me to go faster? <laughs> or do you want me to go slower? What would you like? <laughs> Okay, I think uh, uh, Daniel had a uh, a question during your presentation, and uh, are you available, Daniel? Oh, yeah. Are you there? Any questions for Cynthia? I think truly it's it's definitely a, a very you know sensitive presentation you know all across the board, uh, but again the value the information is so valuable that it, the the dialogue needs to start surfacing and we need to get not only in you know uh, our current you know professions it has to be within the homelands right you have to take ownership of our our history our experiences and when you t- start taking that ownership and understanding the healing starts progressing. I have a question from Paul. Go ahead, Paul. Yeah, thank you for taking my question. Thanks for the presentation this morning. So you had mentioned in the presentation at one point that uh, kids who are in schools off reserve are doing better by um, uh, better than kids who are in schools on reserve. And you sort of you alluded to it. But before you got to that point, you were saying that um, it's important to sort of define what is it that we're hoping to achieve. Um, for our kids. And and I sort of had the question as you were talking about kids on reserve versus off reserve in schools. The question was like, by what measure are kids doing better off reserve in schools? And is that the measure that as you're envisioning what you want for your kids, you would use, right? Like, no, yeah. And that's exactly, yeah, that's what I was getting at. They're, they're being measured uh, on off reserve schools by the same measure as everybody else. How many A's did you get? Did you, you know, graduate from grade, you know, five to six and whatever, but, but on the reserve schools, um, yeah, it's statistically, they seem to be doing, they're not going to school. I, I know in the North, we, like I said, we've got 60% of the kids have not returned to school. So Why? And, and, and if so, if we want to get the schools to actually accommodate the needs of our kids, then we have to change what's happening in those reserve schools to get them into a place where they're actually feeling more comfortable and actually being successful. But I, I hear you. I, and, and those numbers come out. There's The report is listed where it comes from. I don't I didn't just make it up. <laughs> there are people that are actually saying that, yes, you know, kids are doing better off reserve. And, uh, and again, it's maybe accessibility and maybe they have better labs, obviously, off school, off the reserves. I mean, a lot of the reserves in the North don't have access to the kinds of tools and materials that they need to be able to do well in STEM, in STEM um, sciences. They just don't have it. So do, so do we up the language instruction? When I was up in uh, Mistassini, oh, geez, 25 years ago now, um, they had 70% of their kids were dropping out of the school in Misasini. And I said to them, you know, you have a Cree regional education authority. 
why don't you establish a you know a school that is based on the land that that's as rigorous in terms of learning language, living on the land, and all the kinds of pieces that you feel are important for the, your future, and let them go to school there. And then when they graduate from there, if they want to go back into a westernized curriculum, they, they'll be ready. You know, because you have the authority to be able to do that. Uh, I, you know, so I, I think they're doing it now, but it took a long time for them to get there to make that decision. They felt like they couldn't or they weren't allowed to. So is that helpful? Yeah, it is helpful. I get. I guess what I was wondering, because I'm a principal at a primary school off, like in town in Owen Sound. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like I'm a settler, but I and I heard you talking about, you know, sort of this vision of getting kids to come back to the communities, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, as a as an administrator at a, you know, a government funded school, um, I, you know, we we have that sort of um measure of success that you talked about how you know how many A's are you getting and so forth we want every kid to be able to read and all of those kind of things but um you know I guess I guess it's sort of, it's a big question too it's not just me as a principal of a school it's like what right. measure of success could I use in my school that would help me understand whether I'm getting kids who are uh indigenous to closer to your vision of what it is as a community you're hoping for do you see what i mean okay yeah yeah i see what you mean yeah okay and that's that that's those creating those spaces actually that give them the, the, the ability to have the confidence to compete and be a part of the kind of programming that you have I, there's nothing there's nothing wrong with a lot you know these kids brains like the ones that are going to high school that there's nothing wrong with them. it's just that they feel uncomfortable making the it's the transition part that's really creating a lot of the challenges and the trans and the transition on the other end as well i might add so, you know, providing the extra supports that you know they're not going to come to, are you, are you, is it high school that you have or our, our, our primary school? No, no, my school is actually K to two. Oh, oh so you're, these are little kids. Little kids. Yeah. Okay. So the reading. Yeah. So getting, getting these kids into, to read and getting the teachers to really focus on getting, you know, I mean, I know they share books and they do that, but really putting a lot of emphasis on the kinds of books that Indigenous kids are going to, they're going to appeal to them. And there's lots now. I mean, there's no, you know, there's no excuse saying, well, there's no books that have Indigenous kids and there's hundreds of them now. And getting them interested in reading is going to be the key because once they get out of those grades, they're going to go back, they're going to go into primary school, they're going to need to be able to read. And I and I, I find that in a lot of communities, books are not a part of the conversation at the at on, on the on the ground. So I, I really think we need to do that. Uh, libraries have decreased from over 140 to less than 40 and dropping. Yeah. Yeah, so we need to have those library. I mean, I've been in communities that have books, boxes of books, and nothing's on the shelves. You know, it's like, why are these books on shelves so people can actually utilize them? There's no real emphasis on the fact that reading not only is about learning something from a book, it's also about focus and learning how to, you know, to stay with something and being, you know, using your mind to travel. Like, you know, you read a book about a the person that's from another country what is that country and thinking like there's so many things about tangible uh, uh you know access to reading that's going to make a real difference and and you're going to send those kids back with some some interest and they're going to go home with books you know you need to let them take them home so their parents can look at them and they can read them together yeah i can't emphasize i mean we know from i mean from graduate schools if, if you don't like to read you you're not going to make it through university it's going to be very hard for you yeah. Yeah. And Good Minds. So somebody put up, Donna put up, Good Minds is a great website for Indigenous books, for your for your library, for your school and for your teachers. And, and now they come in English and in Ojibwe. There's no, you know, you, you don't even have, you know, you, they, they can see their own language written in those books and, the, you know, with little brown faces. It's it's really important. And I have statistics, not on this on this particular presentation, but I have statistics about how many books, you know, are actually you know, have white, you know, characters and how many have other uh, you know, people of color and, and indigenous. It's quite low still. It's quite low. So I guess really, again, it comes back to us. And, you know, because I, I really think it always comes back to what we do. Um, we just need to be writing more books ourselves and getting them out there. Yeah. Okay, Cynthia, we have another question. Deputy, Deputy Grand Chief Marston. Uh, miigwech. Um, and then... Uh... Good presentation, Cynthia, and thank you, Patrick, Patricia. Um, I'm glad Paul's on because, you know, um, a big part of it is the underfunding for First Nation schools 
we see that all the time. And you compare uh, for off-reserve high school, seven and eight middle, I, I call that uh, junior high, I guess, after school activities, sports, music, uh, there's all, you see all the different clubs, uh, reading club, camera club, different gatherings for students to take part. And if, and if they don't uh, do well in their grades, you know, they're, mm. they'll be threatened while you can't uh, take part in after school activities. So, you know, but a lot of that is uh, First Nation schools are underfunded where they, they can't get the teachers in to do those after school activities, right? So I just like to point that out to Miigwech. Yeah, thank you. And and that, and that's what I was also pointing out that you know we we can't really we have to stop relying on external agency to fix that part of it. You know, we have a lot of people in our communities that have the ability to come out and do that. You know, parents can do that. Um, some of the students that have dropped out that maybe could be taking some some programs in in uh, physical sciences, like they can be learning how to do to do to do gym activities, and you know, hired you know within you know to do that. Like we got to, what have we got? You know, who's in our communities that is you know not doing what they could be doing, and how do we funnel their them into something that's going to make some sense to them? Whether it's you know doing something with the forests that are surround our communities, it's it's checking the water, and we've 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 put our own kids in, in my community into those places where they actually go, they do all the water testing in the summer, so that we know the water's safe. But bringing them into the conversation and getting them to do it, and there are also students, never mind teachers. There are students that are in the physical sciences and physical science is just, you know, kinesiology, gym and all that stuff that will come to a community in the summer for a very small amount of money. And if so long as they got a place to stay, we'll teach that all summer and they could teach the students that have dropped out. Uh, <laughs> yeah. to, you know, right. To do yeah. this work. Right. Like, let's figure out how do we round up the ones that are kind of aimless right now, because those are the ones that end up getting into the drugs and alcohol and, and partying because they don't have anything else to do. And we see it all across the entire country. It's not, not just us. Uh, how do we get them into this situation where we find um, some of the, all those millions of dollars that have supposedly or apparently been allocated to us for, by the provincial government to do this work? How do we get that and direct it to those kids that have dropped out and are, are, are somewhat aimless right now and get them into helping the other kids yeah that's a good point Cynthia to use some of our own people right yeah yeah There's absolutely right on and, and then you have also right to play right that mm -hmm. will come into your communities right to play is uh, is funded and they will send people in who will teach your people how to do recreational planning and they will stay with it for the summer or for a period of time. Teach for Ontario, or Teach for Canada, I mean, sends in teachers who are who are now taught how to teach in remote or, or distant you know, isolated communities. So they learn a little bit of the language. They learn about historic trauma. They learn about residential schools. They learn about, you know, what's going on in a community. They learn about the community before they're sent into it. And we find we have like an 80 something percent uh, retention rate with those teachers. Because they know what they're going into, they're, you know they're not they're not going in blind and going holy hell what am I doing up here in the middle of nowhere? They know where they're going, and we know that they like to be outdoors. You know that they have flexible teaching skills, and that they want to be a part of this particular conversation. So you know that pre planning is a really important part of it. But I think you know, and you've heard me say before, Jim Bob, you've heard me say you know I want to see a chief come to the next meeting with a kid under each arm, and bring the dropouts because they got time. <laughs> We want them there. Okay, is there any other questions? Um, no, okay. So, how, so how's that, Pat? Um, I think that went very, very well. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I know it's a lot of information, but honestly, you, you, those, uh, those of you that are on this know that there's a lot going on and that's a lot of information that needs to be imparted. These will be available to you if you want to go over and go a little more slowly. Um, I want to be able to really more than anything, just spark. You know, I'm not trying to tell you what you don't know or anything like that. I just want to spark a uh, conversation. And that's really what Patricia is looking for here for the Chiefs of Ontario. These webinars will be online so that you know, people can say, oh, yeah, I never really thought about it that way. Or oh, that's a good, you know, that's a good point. So I'll leave it at there. Pat, I'll hand it back to you and you can. Great. All right. Um, Jimmy, Wedge, for your presentation, uh, decolonizing education is is a huge endeavor. Um, again, um, when you when we talk about our 
you know, our homelands and our, our history. And, and it, it's very, very bleak at times. But at the same time, we need to, again, uh, educate ourselves, educate the people. And, the, and obviously, they, they're victims of our history, right? But I see the good in this. I honestly do. I see a path to healing. I see a path to exactly what you're identifying. We're all given our personal bundles. And our, our education bundle should be overflowing. And it is in recognizing the, the traditions of our people, the customs, and the history is rich. There's just that small component within our history that isn't and that we are. And it's providing a barrier. You, we have to recognize that our, our own natural resources, our people that are gifted with these natural resources and very component, various components for success, we need to bring that out. And we understand that. And I think uh, what really resonated with me with your presentation is collectively, you know, as a society, you know, as nations, we are, we need to answer the calls as deliberate, at, with conscious effort. And it's crucial to, to our generation to come, again, to fill those personal bundles, to give them the respect, the need for, for recognition, to be a part of our nations. And you know what, we, we always nurture our, our young, our generations to come only because we are preparing them for their own responsibility for our nations to thrive. And that's what we need to really get back to our that responsibility. And you know, I, I welcome the opportunity to, to have these discussions. Again, you got many nations within within this whole uh, collective here. And I, and I'm very honored, you know, we need knowledge keeper and in the sense Cynthia you're you're a different style of knowledge keeper and and uh for and I welcome you to the team and I I'm just totally always amazed and I'm always thinking about various initiatives to to, to again to carry on that dialogue because it's so important but again Thank you for this presentation. Uh, friendly reminder, everyone, our evaluations, uh, it just gives me a, a framework to, to move forward. And um, this is what we all want to do. A uh, friendly reminder, April 5th is our module number two, uh, Wise Practice in Education and Deconstructing the Special in Special Education uh, through our own truth and internal record. Uh, reconciliation process. Wow, that's 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 large. It's even larger to say. But again, the importance of you know carrying on that uh, dialogue on education and really focusing on spec ed is going to be very very uh, encouraging to have. Um, again, thank you for your valuable time. I I really appreciate it. And I look forward to seeing everybody the next uh, on April 5th. All right. Take care. Bamapi. Bamapi.